here with Kevin, Purge Gamers, Go Deck. Hello. How are you? I'm good. Games uh, are good. Cast any good series yesterday? Um, yeah, I, we had a couple of really cool games. Um, EG had some really cool synergistic drafts where they played Lena like a carry mid and she went Bloodstone uh, after Yule's and then BKB or Shiva's, depending on the game. So that was really cool. Uh, and that was just unlimited mana, so always max fiery soul. So I like that draft a lot. That was really cool. Um, yeah, there's been a couple other really good games. I haven't cast any of the super hype ones, but pretty much every game I've cast has been great. So. This year, man, the, the TI games have been amazing. Yeah. Just one one day, and you are gonna, you can already see it. The patch is quite good. Um, yeah, I think so too. What do you, th what do you, why do you think that is? What, what's, um, what's so good about it? Uh, all the all the top tier heroes, they have counters, I guess. Maybe that's one thing. Um, and it isn't just one overwhelming draft. Uh, I guess last year, Doom was really popular, and he was pretty annoying. Yeah. Uh, Venno, kind of similar. Venno just got really popular towards the end. I mean, it's hard to remember the earlier games, but it, it was very... The meta definitely changed very much right towards the end, so maybe we just remember all the bad parts and not the good parts. But right now, it seems like the games are really good. The comebacks are still possible for both teams. Seems a lot like of fighting. A lot of fighting. The execu it comes down to execution, basically. All the teams have had another year to get better at Dota and, and swap out any new talent they need, so just... You know better. what I noticed? Um, the offlaners from this year to last year? Last year, the uh, offlaners were like Void and like... Ones, uh, some, some of the ones that just like run away, like Weaver was uh, played a lot. Last year was a refresher patch too, because yeah. there was a lot of Tide and so. stuff. And it was just like, uh, this year it seems like the offlane heroes, you have like Tusk, like Clockwork, and like those heroes are just like more exciting, you know? Yeah, less around like team fighting and more about like ganking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and you saw EG go one one twice, um, and mm -hmm. they were one of the favorites in that group. Uh, and it's you know super critical to go two zero. Um, do you have any uh, do you have any predictions what's gonna happen? Um, out of all the teams that I cast yesterday, which was VP, newbie, and EG, I thought EG looked the best <coughs> despite uh -huh. all of those games being one one. So. Um, the one game they got stomped, it was just newbie obviously knew how to deal with Bounty Hunter, and they went all in on an invis strat, and it didn't work at all. So it just they, seemed like a... Like yeah, that a, game, uh, that game they had a storm too, and like, EG had no, no disables. Yeah, so that, you know. as soon as they lost the early game, there was no way to kill the storm, in addition to them playing good against the bounty. So it seemed like their strat, that strat was probably one of their lower tier strats. I would guess that they were planning to use just to <coughs> play against one of the teams they didn't expect to be that good. And then as soon as that happened, they whipped out the Lena mid core with Clink's safe lane and the Skyrath mage strat, and then they, they completely took Nubia apart. So after watching that, I was like, all right, EG's still pretty good. But then they ended up losing their last game of the day as well and going 1-1 as a whole, but it was still pretty close. So um, I think they were the best out of yesterday, but Nubia did a lot better than I thought they would. And, uh, you know, last year you did a lot of the Nubia cast, like the, for the uh -huh. newer newcomers. Um, they don't seem to have that for the group stages this year. Yeah, they're not doing it for the group stage. Um, they wanted a bit more, um, some of my words might be slightly wrong because I haven't had this conversation in like a month, but they, they wanted it more cast heavy and less newbie stream because last year every game started and they wanted us to start casting as if that was there was a brand new person watching, like brand new audience every single time. Um, and it got a little tiring to cast that way because every game we'd be like, we'd have to remember this is a tower, this is a creep, all those basics, and sometimes we just kind of wanted to enjoy the game a little bit, because sometimes when you're doing that and the game gets really hype, then you can't really focus yeah. on that, which is a little bit of a downer. The other downside is then we cast it just about every game. It wasn't always a Suns fan and I, but it was that either us or Pyrian, Shane Blitz. So um, when the finals rolled on or the the key arena stuff, then we were casting for like five hours a day, kind of a thing, and that just burns you out if you have to do it every single day. So we we worked a lot more last year, and um, that's one of the benefits of us doing it less. Um, downside is that there's no newbie stream for group stage, which I feel like eh, maybe maybe we could have had it, but but if you do that, then that's a lot of work. And I think a lot of, of the new players will come in for the uh, main stage anyway. You're probably right. Yeah. I know there's been a couple that have been interested. I've seen tweets and stuff, but I don't know. Is, is it worth it? Is Are the resources worth it? Do you fly in like three or four more people just for the couple thousand of people that might watch in group stage. Yeah, that's right. And it's only one best of three this time um, for the main event. We're only You're doing, doing OD Pixel. If you yes, like. OD Pixel and I are, are doing the newbie stream, and it's only one best of three at the beginning of each day for the main event. So it's always the first set, starts at 9 a.m., I believe, and um, yeah, and then we're done for the day, or at least I am. OD has more stuff to cast, but yeah, just one BO3 newbie stream a day. So if you guys are new, you got to tune in at that moment. So, um, you know, you, you had a... You know, you had your 
time in Korea and now you're back focusing on casting. Uh, mm -hmm. What have you learned since since then? Um, Stylistically or like, you know, knowledge wise. Right, in terms of Dota or? Either just, either one. Okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of Dota, <coughs> I've gotten a lot better at tri -laning. That was the, the main thing that I was lacking when I was playing in Korea was my tri -lane was kind of weak. Um, it was like, uh, it's very easy to get flustered and if you don't tri -lane enough and practice that enough, it really messes you up. So. At the highest level, it seems like they always know what to do, but that's because they played so many games in that role. Um, and I, I, we weren't static enough at doing basic tri -lane things, and because of that, we would lose our tri -lane very often, and that led to us losing a lot. And I think that was mostly an experience, but also partially because when we first got there, the offlanes would die all the time, so we'd sit around waiting for the offlanes to die. And like later on, the offlanes stopped dying in obvious ways. So then we would have to fall back on tri -laning, but we hadn't been practicing it much because we were always like killing and stuff like that so we, we basically we just got hit with not knowing how to try lane effectively we'd miss pulls we'd not connect it correctly sometimes just a bunch of really basic stuff that you can't mess up as a sport so that's stuff I really focused on when I stopped playing on the team and I, I solved that problem by just playing a lot of support in pubs I would only play uh, support when I played rank solo and that that raised my MMR by like 300 at least. Isn't that tilting? Isn't what? Tilting? Playing support? No. A lot? No? You enjoy it? Yeah, I actually, I I'm like, terrible at it. So it's I think it's really fun. Um, I, I just it's just a slightly different mentality, and I I didn't gank or roam that much before. But by playing support, you're the the way you get value out of your hero if you are the higher MMR, or if you're the one that needs to make stuff happen. It's by it's by roaming. It's not necessarily by warding and sitting behind your allies. Like yeah, those parts are important too. But setting up ganks and roaming are by far the most important. That stuff's actually exciting. Like do ganking they, people is fun. Do they try and uh? Like when you're the high MMR in your in in your party, do they try and um, try and make you play mid or anything like that? You're just like, no, I'm playing support. I always say I'm playing support. The only time I don't is when two people pick support before me, but that only happens like probably less than five times in like six months. It's kind of a thing. I usually just write right away I'm support, and then I pick it. If uh, if I'm the highest MMR, I usually play like a high impact support, like Lion or something like that. That way, I can get solo kills on carries. But if it's a much higher game, I'll play something a bit more defensive. Usually like Dazzle, maybe still Lion if they have a Storm, but. I'll, I'll I'll open the hero pool a lot more, maybe Shadow Demon if I'm if I'm the not the highest, but if I'm the highest, I need to be. What's your team's reaction? Oh, Snowball, high support. Yeah, doesn't happen often. Usually. People people get confused sometimes. They're like, "Are you sure you don't want mid?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I'm support." And it's fine as long as you roam correctly. It's you can totally be the high MMR. I mean, I haven't I haven't played any of those extreme scenarios where I'm like 6.5k and all my team is 4.2 because I'm not that high in MMR. But um, if usually I'm within like 500 from the average in those games, and it's fine. I think. And uh, what about uh, what about casting wise? Um, stuff learned from casting. Um, I guess I've adapted to be more of an analyst rather than a play-by-play. -play. When I when I used to cast a couple years ago, I would do a mix of both. I thought, and um, I worked kind of hard to get. I worked pretty hard. I mean, I casted a lot, but I didn't really refine myself a huge amount. I just kind of like put in the hours and let myself grow that way. So I could have been better about growing in in that way, but. Um, a lot of the play-by-plays -play are, are very good right now, and I still stumble my words a little bit too much when hype is going on, and no other top play-by-play -play does that, so I just don't want to even attempt it sometimes because... Do you think that's the way to go? It's a gamble. Like uh, specializing in one of those? I mean, my mentality is that if the world was perfect and everybody could do everything as, as they wanted, then I think it's better if you have two people that interchange personally because I don't like the... You take a turn, I take a turn. I like two casters that interact with each other a lot and talk to each other and mm -hmm. seem like they're just hanging out. So um, yesterday I was talking over Coddle Guy a little bit too much due to that, I think. Um, but it's just because I want to, either I'm excited about sharing something that I just realized or, um, or I just think it's better if it's, you know, you're finishing, maybe not finishing sentences, but like interacting and agreeing, like as they're talking and like having it be a more of a dynamic thing and sometimes you step on their toes but I think it makes for a better viewing experience where it sounds like the casters actually like each other and combo a bit I think I think that's better so I, I like that method personally but I know there's some casters that are pretty against that because they have their role and it would kind of hurt them if maybe, not, maybe that's not why they feel that way but um, you know people like, have different preferences and I think mine's a little bit more 50-50 and I like doing a mix of stuff uh, you're, you know, how's, how's a YouTube channel? Going? Um, YouTube, my views are a lot lower than they were when I left Korea. Um, the sacrifices. It was it was a sacrifice. Uh, I mean, I put a lot less, I put out a lot less videos, so the views that would have trickled continuously since that moment have decreased. 
but it's not the end of the world really. I, I never really diversified my content very much, so I, I didn't put enough work into it, and now I'm doing an okay job. Also, my TI that I make no videos, but um, I don't know. I, I I don't think I want to do YouTube forever because I'm not very good at diversifying and I don't like editing videos, so I'm kind of limited on there. I'd almost have to hire somebody else to help me out, but I mean, I'll still make videos for a long time, I'm sure, but um, it's, uh, it's not everything to me, I guess, so just trying to diversify throughout the Dota scene. Do you I still have a plan? Game, obviously. Long-term plan? Not really. That's, that's the problem. I don't have a long-term plan, mm -hmm. and because of that, I'm not really focusing my efforts the way I need to, I think. I'm just kind of coasting sometimes, and I you shouldn't know, do that. You a brainstorming session. Yeah, I should, and then I also have to... I think uh, step one is get really motivated, because lately I've been kind of coasting too much. But now that I'm pretty settled in my house... Majors. Uh, gotta... Yeah, only other really... Yeah, going to majors I really want to do, but that's more of a casting role, obviously. Um, the only other thing that I really want to do is an announcer pack, and I talked to some Valve guys while I was recording audio, and um, they gave me some tips on recording hardware and stuff, so hopefully I can slam that out within a couple months when I get back. That's that's really the only thing that I have on my plate, other than potentially casting majors. But who knows how many people will be invited, and I might not make the cut. So, mm. how, what do you think? Uh, what do you think you have to do to to ensure? I mean, it depends. If if there's equal as many casters as TI, then I would obviously make the cut, right? Because I've already made the cut here. But if uh, if they reduce it by two sets of analytical and play-by-play, -play, then I probably won't make the cut, I think. If they don't have a newbie stream, I don't think I'll make the cut. It really depends do, on the I number will, of games, right? Uh, the number, number of teams. I mean, DAC was equal teams, right? It was like 16, yeah. so... But they had a shorter... I thought the group stage was slightly shorter, right? I, I don't remember at all. Like four days um, here. It comes down to a lot of things. could be Valve choosing things. It could be they put it out... They gave the initial contract to a studio, and then the studio gets in like half their people to do it. It could be Valve makes the full decisions. I mean, nobody really knows what's going to happen in the next six months. Mm -hmm. No caster knows, no studio knows. The only people that knows are a uh, mind reader, or not even that, maybe like a future teller. Because like Valve, teller. Valve doesn't even make up their minds until like the last two months tops, you know? So they don't even and They're going to be tired from TI, so they're going to take a break after probably Yeah, two. almost for sure. But So, so you know, you don't, you don't really know what's going to happen. So knowing whether or not I'll be invited, I think it comes down to if they have equal caster base, then I think I'll make it, and if they have a noob stream, I will make it. You know what I, I don't know if they'll have those. When I look at casting, it's like, it's really a competitive, you know, cutthroat kind of, and everyone kind of, these days, it seems to be taking a lot more seriously, like everyone's like watching all the games and like taking notes and like prep preparing, Yeah. but is the knowledge part of it really, like, like how, like all that preparation, like, is it really like... Are you talking about MMR? Or no, just like, uh, just the, like... Like watching the, games the coddle like, guy prep like with a huge notebook he writes everything well more, th more than just coddle I do that like a lot of, a lot of casters do that yeah so. um, I, I think it's a I mean it's, it's the nature of any competition if you think about what Dota was like as a competitive sport even four years ago it was very different I mean nobody had a coach really it was basically just five players slamming in half of them like very few teams probably boot camp now every team boot camps pretty much that has the resources it's like if if you if you need an edge and the competition gets close, you look for another edge, and the casters are doing that as well, and it's honestly very professional, and it's something we all should probably be doing anyways, is doing your research, doing your notes and stuff. Some casters are more naturally talented than others, so they can get away with less study, and it's the same with Dota players. Like Some Dota players are just more naturally talented, so they don't have to grind as much. They might not need to boot camp, they might just understand Dota better than the other teams, therefore they don't have to go for those extra things. So the ones that are maybe lazy and don't do the research, they might still get in if they're talented or special, but you know, at some point they might get edged out, and there have been more and more casters getting edged out over the last two years or so do due to inactivity or lack of, you know, not as hard working. Do you think that um, it's important to be affiliated with a studio? Because you're kind of like, you know, freelance, not really. Yeah. Um, do you um, think you need to be, like, I mean, you're probably closely, most closely associated with BTS since you work with them a little bit more than... And I live nearby. Yeah, so. and you live near them. But do you think it's, like, important to be, like, with a studio uh, so that they can, like, represent you and have a group, you know? See, that's another hard question that we don't know. It comes down to the major thing. Like, mm -hmm. uh, who gets the... In who, who chooses invites? Does Val choose them or does... Do the studios choose them? If the studios choose them, then it's extremely important to be with the studio because that gives you the guaranteed in. Unless you're, like, Cinder and Merlini, then it doesn't matter because you're already top of your class anyways. You'll get the invite. But if it's based on studios, then getting the major invites are... Uh, you know, up to whether, like I said before, if it's studio choice or valve choice. So, in that in that sense, yes. Um, if you're if you're an up and coming caster or you're a tier two or tier three caster, 
extremely important. Like, uh, look at Carl Gaino, he got a TI invite, um, but you know, not even two years ago, he was a nobody basically. He got popular, he went on to BTS, I think Zyari is maybe a better example. Someone that very few people respected when he first started casting. And Cap they, too. Yeah. And Cap as well. And then they joined their studios, BTS versus joined Dota. They put the grind in and then really got better at their craft and got to a point where they're now casting TI, which is really good for them. So yeah, it's uh, it takes the grind, it really does. Um, it's partially grind, the studios help, but we don't really know what the landscape will be like, so all the studios are probably scared right now because they don't know what the majors are going to be like, they don't know how the invites work, and maybe all these people that they're paying salaries for are going to be a hindrance to their to their business. So it's good to be in a position like mine right now, I think, because if, depending on which way it goes, I could, I could align myself. I'm like a sellsword, you know? <laughs> You're like a sellsword. <laughs> yeah, I'm like okay. the, the, what's the, the phrase, dude? I'm just waiting to see what happens, and I'm going to hop in and stab. For the winning side. Yeah, yeah, maybe you shouldn't have said that, but... Stab. <laughs> You're Spoilers. Bludgeon the other. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, okay, well, you know, thanks for thanks for sitting down with us. A uh, little, little serious, but I think it was informative for uh, for those watching. Up and coming casters. Yeah. No, is it, people want, you know, it's not all rainbows and... It's like some... There's a, there's a moderate amount of stress on people, you know? Yeah, some more than others. Yeah. Um, do you uh, do you have any do you have any words? Um, thanks to my sponsors, uh, Score Esports and Dota Buff, and uh, thanks to my girlfriend. That's about it. Okay. Thanks for being my friend, Ken. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for doing the interview. Do you have a call out? Uh, no, I don't. No, no one. Okay. I'm I'm pretty at peace nowadays. <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks.